So, it's time for the XFL 2020. This is the American Ways Podcast, Episode 1. I am your host, Andrew Stiles. Over the next few minutes, we'll be looking at the XFL timeline. From pretty much late 2017, actually. Not just the announcement, to the present day. So, how'd this all start? Well, back in late 2017, December 15th to be exact, Bleacher Report reported that Vince McMahon was considering reviving the XFL, but not in its original pro-wrestling-inspired incarnation, but rather a more serious venture that would actually try to be a league that would last for a long time. And eventually they would make an announcement on January 25th, and doing so, Vince McMahon also noted that he was merely going to fundraise and found the Alpha Entertainment LLC that was going to run the league. He would let someone else take over control who actually knew what he was doing. Enter Oliver Luck, the commissioner of the XFL, former West Virginia athletic director, and commissioner for NFL Europe. So he's the one with all the football experience. Together, they have, over the last few years, built a league that includes Bob Stoops, Landry Jones, pretty much solid talent here all around throughout this league. Several announcements have come along these last few years. The cities were announced in late December, and soon the next coach was announced, the first one, Bob Stoops, who now coaches the Dallas Renegades. Other announcements were June Jones, Pep Hamilton, Jim Zorn, Winston Moss, Jonathan Hayes, Mark Kresman, Kelvin Kilbride, etc. And eventually, back here in late August, the team names were announced. Dallas Renegades, Houston Roughnecks, Los Angeles Wildcats, Seattle Dragons, DC Defenders, New York Guardians, St. Louis Battlehawks, and the Tampa Bay Vipers. Even a Team 9, which is working in Dallas, Texas, and will basically be a practice squad for all the teams. So, what are the rules of this league? Well, here's what we got. The kickoff is still around, in a form or fashion. Unlike the Alliance, where you would just start at the 25, which is boring as all crap, you instead kick from your own 25-yard line, instead of the 35, which is going to make it a little harder to kick right into the end zone. But if you do, you immediately let the opposing team get a touchback at their own 35, just 65 yards out from the end zone instead of 75. So that's not good. That's, that's not good at all if you want to be a kicking team. So, what do you do? Well, very simply, you kick it short. But when you kick it short, the receiving and kicking units, the 10 players on each team, the ones that are not the kicker or the receiver, are merely lying just 5 yards apart from each other. There will be no high-speed collisions that will cause injuries and concussions. Instead, there will be running lanes for the receivers to attempt to make a return. And in a couple of uh, scrimmage games, notably one of the Springling games, there was a return touchdown pretty easily. So we'll see how that works out. Kickoffs that go out of bounds or fall short of hitting the receiving team's 20-yard line come out to the 45. So that's also really, really difficult to deal with if you're a kicker. You're going to have to be accurate. You have a 20-yard window to kick the ball, which doesn't sound too hard. But my bet is someone in the first couple weeks is going to screw it up. Onside kick is also going to be more of the same. Punts in the XFL also vary. While you tried a coffin corner punt, as someone would call it, and you would put it right in that five-yard line, or you'd let your team run down and down it there, you're not able to do that. If you kick it out of bounds, it's a touchback. And all the way up to the 35-yard line, that's where the ball goes. And if you completely mess it up, and it goes in front of the opponent's 35, and it goes out of bounds, they get to start even closer to your own end zone. So, if you're a kicker, life's going to be a little more difficult than usual. You're going to need veins of ice, as kickers always have. 
But yeah, touchbacks instead of the 20 in the old NFL and now 25 in both there and college, it's now to the 35 and out of bounds kicks to the 45. Less yards for the opposing team to drive. Again, you're going to want to set up a kickoff. You're going to want to get a solid kicker who can put in those 20 yards. If they fail, you're in a lot of trouble because you're going to be giving up 10 or 15 yards every single possession. That's not the recipe for victory. That's a recipe for failure. Points after touchdown as well are also incredibly different. Instead of just kicking one point or going four for two at the two-yard line, we have a three-point system. One-point conversions will be your regular two-point conversion in the NFL or college football from the two. A two-point conversion will be from the five, and a three-point conversion will be from the ten, which means you can score up to nine points on the drive. This means that an 18-point lead is still a two-possession game. So, leads, unless it's a 40-point lead in the fourth, aren't exactly safe. So, what are the likelihood of you getting the extra points? Well, in the simulations, the XFLs run, and in the scrimmages, it seems that the one-point conversion is a coin flip. Heads or tails. You're going to have a 50% chance to ram it in. The five-yard line is a 30% chance, and the ten-yard line three-pointer is a 20% chance. You're going to have to run the analytics, you have to run the odds, and see what you want to take. It's likely, as we've seen in scrimmages, that teams are probably going to score, at this talent level, the exact same amount of touchdowns usually. Games are probably going to come down to PATs a lot more than we think. There's also a double forward pass. Now, this is my least favorite rule, and it's also the one I don't think we'll be seeing very often. Because, let's say, anyone, you've watched how the New England Patriots played in the Super Bowl a couple years back. They threw that lateral, Brady threw that lateral to Edelman, and then he threw it 40 yards downfield. That's basically what this is. The double forward pass is merely just forward pass that ends up behind the last scrimmage. It's basically a lateral, but just a couple yards ahead. I don't see how teams are going to abuse or take advantage of this, honestly. Maybe one or two teams, if they're desperate in the middle of the season, will go outside of the box. Until such time, I don't think this rule is going to be very used. Which is a shame, I mean, it is kind of gimmicky, but I suppose we'll eventually see someone try it and see how well it works. Meanwhile, we also have a running clock, as it were. Running clock? But clocks always run in football, unless there's an incomplete pass. That's where the thing changes. Unless you're inside of two minutes of the half, the clock will run continuously. Incomplete passes do not stop the clock, which is going to make running the clock out when you have a lead a lot more easy, because you can both run and pass and not have to worry about the clock stopping. So, after the two-minute warning, which, yes, the XFL will use, there will be a two-minute warning like in the NFL and unlike college, the ball is spotted and the clock starts up again. But until that moment after the play stops, the clock's not running. And yes, incomplete pass inside the two-minute warning, and out of bounds, and spiking the football all do stop the clock then. And the play clock itself is 25 seconds long. And you only get two timeouts, per half, instead of three. And finally, this is pretty important, instant replay reviews as far as we can tell, seem to be determined to be conducted inside of 60 seconds. No coach challenges. Sky Judge does all reviews. This isn't going to take five minutes. If you can't find evidence immediately, the game goes on. But after all of this, there's probably one rule that will, in the end, if there is a tie, be the most important. And there is a big if, because not many people realize this, but while we probably will see over time once this season, we won't be seeing it often. Because, with the tiered extra point system, it's going to be a lot harder to tie because you could see the score like, say, three touchdowns, two field goals, and one correct one-pointer and two-pointer, so three plus whatever. You Let me think. I, I did math, and I forgot to actually do math. 
But basically, you're going to have like 27 to 15. 21 to 18. Scores are going to look a lot weirder than usual. That's just how it is. It's going to be very hard to tie, but in case you do tie, there is an overtime, and it's very different. So now college has the one possession from your opponent's 25, and you've got four downs to advance the football for a first down, and then to try to get a touchdown, blah, blah, blah. You only get one play. You get one play from your opponent's five. Five times. And each of those five conversions you make, you get two points. And if it's tied after those five, then you get another try. And you keep going in sudden death. So let's say the score is 27 to 27. It's been a hard-fought game between, let's say, the Battlehawks and the Vipers. So, the Vipers convert three of their first four, which means they now have 33 points. The Battlehawks are only at 29 They've missed three out of four. That's it. There's no need for a fifth round because it's impossible for the Battle Locks to catch back up. They're four back. It's not happening. So, it's... If you want a comparison, just watch one soccer shootout. That's an excellent comparison. It's basically penalty kicks like in soccer shootouts, but it's one play from your opponent's five. Basically, no games will end in a draw. You're not going to have like a six, three, and one record. So, who are the teams participating in this league? Let's go through them. First, the Western Division. Perhaps the crown jewel franchise of the league, the Dallas Renegades in Arlington, Texas. They will be playing in the newly renovated Globe Life Park in Arlington. Now it's been converted to house football and soccer instead of baseball as the Rangers have moved to Globe Life Field. The capacity is about 25,000. The head coach is Bob Stoops. Their in-state rivals will be the Houston Roughnecks. They will be playing in TDECU Stadium, which has a capacity of 40,000. They are led by June Jones, who will look to organize a run-and-shoot offense. Will this work? Possibly. But basically, in the scrimmage game, it was estimated they only had about 25 rushing yards. They are not a running football team. They will throw all over the place. Perhaps the team that has the least amount of hype behind them is Los Angeles Wildcats. They're mainly here for the Fox and ESPN TV deal that we'll get into later. They play at the Digny Health Sports Park. If you're thinking that it sounds somewhat familiar, well, it was the home of the Chargers. And estimates are that they'll outdraw the Chargers and fans. It might be like, how is that possible? Very simple. By me now drawing the fans, I mean them at drawing in L.A. fans. That place could probably get 15,000 and still have more fans than the Chargers ever had, because let's be honest, the percent of that stadium was opposing fans every week. Let's be honest. But yes, the Wildcats are led by Winston Moss. And finally, rounding out the Western Division are the Seattle Dragons. They are the first of the teams to not use the full capacity stadium. Usually, Central League Field has 69,000, but in an effort to make certain tickets are correct, that they fill the stadium technically, but only using the lower bowl, and this won't be the only time we see it. So instead of a capacity of 69,000, it's probably about... Let me think here. I actually have no idea. It's probably like 25, 30,000. But yeah, that rounds out the Western Division. The Eastern Conference is led by the DC Defenders, who are from the nation's capital and will play at the Audi Field, which is usually housed for soccer, but in this case will be football. The capacity is perhaps the lowest in the league at 20,000, and they are led by Pep Hamilton. The other three parks are all just using a lower bowl seating in the Eastern Conference. The first one is the New York Guardians. They'll be playing at Medlife, home of the Jets and Giants, and they are led by Kevin Kilbride. Jonathan Hayde leaves the St. Louis Bellhawks, the only city with an XFL team that does not have an NFL team. Lowy playing at the Rams Old Stadium, the Dome in America Center. And finally, the Vipers house up in Tampa Bay, Florida at Raymond James Stadium, home of the Buccaneers, led by Mark Trestman. And finally, the practice squad team, Team Nine, housed in Dallas, Texas. And we've just learned that Bart Andrews will lead that team, and they will be a practice squad and the general idea is that by week six, there'll be a new batch of players that aren't going to be there now, 
because all the players from that team from week 1 to 5 have already found their way on teams from injuries or waivers. So basically, Team 9's the top free agents. <coughs> These two divisions will have a 10-week regular season total and will play teams in their division twice and teams outside of their conference once. And, if you're in the playoffs, you'll be playing a team three times. And what do you mean by three times? Well, you've already played a division rival twice in the longer season, and let's say you win the conference, but you still got to face a team in your own division a third time to get to the championship game. Which means that every team will play each other once, and some teams will have played each other three times. So, four games per week will be played during the regular season. There are no buys. The games will usually be held on Saturday and Sunday across ESPN. ESPN 2 for like one game or two games. FS I know ESPN 2 and FS2 have about three games total out of the 43, if you count playoffs. But ESPN mainly, FS1, ABC, and Fox will carry 40 of the games. An excellent TV bill if there ever was one. So each team hosts five home games and gets five away games and is determined to have a home game and away game for certain against each of their divisional rivals. The first games are simply six days after Super Bowl 54, just like the old XFL. The league will never plan to move to the fall. There's no reason to. We won't try to fill any potential lockout void in 2021. It's not worth the risk. We saw what happened in the United Football League when they tried that. I'm like, what's the United Football League? Exactly, they failed. So, that's basically the schedule. Oh, and there are two Fox-based Thursday night games. I forgot about that. There are two Thursday night games, one in Week 9 and one in Week 10. I believe both have the Renegades in them, even. Which is interesting, how the Renegades put both of those slots. Is that true? Um, let me think. I'm gonna check. Let's see if that's correct. Um, having issues with the pause button trying to cut out time. I'll just talk while I search it up. Season schedule, XFL. I'm assuming. Yep, Dallas gets both first day games. An away game with the Roughnecks in week 9 at home against the Wildcats in week 10. That's a bit weird quirk of the scheduling, to be honest. I'm interested in that. But, yeah. All four teams will play on all four major networks. Some will play on more than others. I know the running games are like seven with Fox and FS1. Only like three with the ESPN BC collision. The XFL is going to use a standard four contract. You'll be paid about 3000 each week if you're on the active roster. By 3000 a week, I mean average. About 1000 a little over 1000 is guaranteed. But you earn a 2.2 thousand victory opponent. If you get a victory bonus, it's because you beat another team. That's twice of your average money. So win your games to get money. And quarterbacks are going to make even way more. They're going to be near the 500000 range. The average quarterback will expect to earn 125000 You can bet there's some serious championship bonuses in there. So yeah, salary cap's basically going to be a several million per team. Head coaches slash GMs, since every head coach is a GM, I have not mentioned that previously, is getting 500000 a year, and you'll have an operation staff team of about 25 people. And finally, there was no territorial draft. Teams had a pretty interesting way to sign their players. The XFL draft was held in mid-October, and you were signed one quarterback, and in some cases, that assigned quarterback will start the season, Landry Jones likes to start season as long as he comes back from injury correctly. Uh, St. Louis Bellhawks, Jordan Tamu is confirmed to start. But in one case already, the assigned quarterback has already been traded. Luis Perez of the Wildcats got traded. So, because Josh Johnson came in, I believe, and took over spot in the Sunday Mile draft. But first you had those Tier 1 quarterback allocations. Then you had skill players. By skill players, we meant backup quarterbacks, running backs, tight ends, and wide receivers. And basically, each team had 10 picks to amass as many players as they wanted each position. So that was the first one, skill players, and then we had offensive line, defensive front seven, 
the defensive backs slash safeties, and finally an open draft that lasted for 30 rounds, which means 30 picks for each of the eight teams. And then finally, we had tons of sentimental drafts beyond that. So yes, lots of players to go through for a 52-man roster. It's likely that over 100 players for each team have rotated for the doors to get down to the final 52 for each team, and then for whoever runs up on Team 9. But yeah, that's basically the full overview, except for, of course, broadcasts, which have already been somewhat touched over. But yeah, I believe ESPN's got the championship game. ABC's got like 13 or 16 games. That's They had quite a few more than you average. So yeah, that's pretty much the overview of the new XFL, and over the next few days we'll be taking a look at every single team as we count down to the XFL season start. So, be seeing you then. This is the American Noise Podcast. This was a bit of a short episode. Most of the episodes will be short. Uh, the week one, the preview weeks are probably going to be the longest episodes. Because four episodes, there will be five episodes per week in regular season. As I've said before. Did I say that before? I don't think I actually have. Basically, we're having this episode, which just happened. Eight team preview episodes, and then a week one preview, and four review episodes each week, one for each game, and then it starts up again until the playoffs. And then we'll see what happens. But yep, this is American Noise Podcast. Free to like, share, subscribe, whatever you do. Follow the rest of the podcast here on XFL Newsroom. And we'll be seeing you again very soon.